And Father, have you seen the devil in real flesh? <laughs> <laughs> it has appeared independently. Yeah. But one of the reasons they like to attack women or possess women is because of their hatred for the Blessed Virgin Mary and the women are in that same image. Wow. How can you share about your experience about St. Michael Reddick stuff? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great to have one, by the way. That's awesome to see. I'm glad you have one. Yeah, yeah, they got you. third of the way through that first St. Michael. She was holding the stone. And both of us experienced just this popping sensation. Wow. Um, yeah. You have absolutely no uh diabolic battling or any level of spiritual warfare whatsoever that's not, that's not a good sign uh do only, i have an authority to perform deliverance over my family yes actually you do so well what we're discovering is, is that demons are attacking people precisely because people are what we you know what we would call soft targets yeah. yeah i think so i mean it was a real turning point for my spiritual life because i realized the seriousness I of what I'm doing as an extra I had. I mean, the demons do all sorts of things like threatening to kill you and stuff like that, but it's usually mm -hmm. idle threats. And we do a lot of. I never wanted to be an exorcist. I tell people I still don't want to be an exorcist. I've resolved uh, myself to being an exorcist at this point. <laughs> but she went down on the ground, manifested, and she completely changed into the shape of a man, started screaming. Um, and, but it wasn't that loud of a scream. It was probably not much louder than I'm talking now but then um also that that's what hell looked like and so it's the only time i've really been afraid being an exorcist is like living the christian life writ large it means like one demon that i'm dealing with right now his one of the things that just completely crushes him is in having to reflect on how exhausted christ was during the passion and yet he kept going and they just had actually cursed texts that they would send to people mm -hmm. else certain people come to us to be are being possessed because they're watching pornography online mm -hmm. pornography is cursed so the satanist uh satanic uh rituals and witchcraft are now being posted online to be talked about online there's whole chat rooms there's whole websites yeah. and stuff now so it's um we were just talking before we started this if you just said the rosary saying the rosary mm -hmm. on a daily basis those are the types of things that keep us protected it's probably one of the top exorcists worldwide Mm -hmm. And um, he uh, he noticed that a lot of the Muslims were actually coming for help to him because mm -hmm. the Christ name itself has a certain force, a spiritual force to it. And so um, we've noticed that among Protestants that they can drive out kind of low-level forms of even possession. And so we really encourage the parents to provide the spiritual protection for the children by blessing them, commanding the demons to leave them alone, saying 80% of problems in marriages are either because their marriage is invalid and they need to get it sacramentally cleaned up, oh. or they're not following, um, that God will use the demons to draw the person back to him so that they have to fight their way out, they grow in virtue, they grow in holiness. He said that if you have a devotion to her under that title, she will protect you and your family from diabolical mm. incursion. So, so our lady has been very good, given given signal graces in our family regarding our devotion to her. Um, I did the total consecration to Our Lady shortly after I was out of high school. That's been significant for uh, so. For example, an example of a signal of grace in my own father's life. My father had a lifelong devotion to Our Lady. He prayed to her every single he prayed to her every single night before he went to bed. And he was always uh, saying the rosary every single day was considered a sign of predestination to heaven. So our Lady finally get to a session. I've probably paid for at least an hour in some cases up to two hours before i even mm. start a session i can honestly say that, di that people who are possessed find it more difficult to go to the old mass than the new yeah. so you know I, it doesn't mean that the nose was evil or anything. it just means that we have just it's just by way of observation we've noticed it's harder for the demons to sustain being in the traditional latin mass
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Direct the Lord our actions by thy holy inspiration and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may be in from thee and by thee, the evidence of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Virgin most powerful. Pray, Pray for us. us. Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, Father Chad Reperger. Welcome to our program, Father. And I am so excited to this interview. And I know many of our viewers are so excited to hear uh, and to share your wisdom to us right now. Good. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, Father. And I know you're such a busy man, but. Thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. Um, I'm curious, Father, do you have a chance to invite here in the Philippines? I was actually invited um, about two years ago. Well, three years ago, it was about... Um, there is a priest there that actually runs the... Um, uh, he does conferences for exorcists and for priests there in the Philippines, and he invited me and I had originally accepted. And then COVID, it, was meant it got put off. And then um, by the time we cycled back around to the point where I could actually be present there in the Philippines, my schedule had kind of shifted around. So I told him it was going to take a little while before I could get worked back into um, when I'd be able to be there with them. Oh, I see. Uh, but uh, is there any follow-up after that? Um... <laughs> Not yet, but it's just a part of it is uh, the priest knows how busy I am, so he's, he's kind of giving me a little bit of time. Thank you so much again uh, for this opportunity. Uh, can you share some uh, brief background about yourself? Who is Father Chad Reperger? Um, well, I was a priest who was ordained about well, it's 26 years now, so it's 26 years ago I was actually ordained. And then um, I was ordained for the priest and fraternity of St. Peter. I taught. Well, I worked in one year in a parish, and then I taught for four years for the diocese and seminary in Lincoln. And then I taught for seven years at the Fraternity of St. Peter's Seminary. Um, and then at a certain point, I was actually transferred to Idaho at the request of my superiors to do a particular project there. Once that was finished, then um, I uh, was invited by Bishop Slattery, who's in Tulsa, mm. Oklahoma, to come and found a society of priests that does exclusively exorcism work. So uh, we're a semi-contemplative order that does, uh, we pray about three to four hours a day. And then um, the only other pastoral we work we do is exorcism. Um, after Bishop Slattery retired, the Bishop, uh, Archbishop of Denver invited us to um, found our community here. So we actually moved to Denver at that time, and we've been here for about six or seven years. So that's kind of where I'm at. I've done a lot of writing in this area. I've done just spent a lot of time trying to promote um, the church's tradition in a variety of mm. different ways. But uh, that's pretty much it, I think. I'm curious, Father, uh, why did you choose to become a priest? Well, I think it was more God chose to become a priest. When I was four years old, I was actually attending Mass with my mom. Um, mm. I was the youngest in the family, and so all of my um, brothers and sisters went back to, uh, they were going to school, and my mom decided to go back to going to Mass every day, and so she took me along, and it was when I was about four years old, I was sitting in the pew, and I saw the priest giving communion, and the thought came into me, that's what I want to do, and it just stuck with me the rest of my life. So um, mm -hmm. it's kind of always been there. Um, and, uh, I started taking it very seriously as I started getting towards the end of high school and there, entered the seminary shortly after high school. And can you tell us the moment you 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 realized that you are called to be an exorcist? And what are the early challenge uh, you face? Yeah, that's, those, that, those are actually because I, <laughs> I, uh, I never wanted to be an exorcist. I tell people I still don't want to be an exorcist. I've resolved uh, myself to being an exorcist at this point. <laughs> but it basically boils down to um, when I was teaching at the fraternity seminary, in, um, which is just outside of Lincoln, Nebraska, um, I was also uh, in residence in Omaha, Nebraska, which is just a little ways from there. And the pastor asked me to take a look at somebody who'd come in to visit him. And um, I had 
not got training as an exorcist, but I had done enough deliverance work and I had done enough um, just, you know, praying over people and knowing generally I'd written some stuff on how to interact mm -hmm. with us psychologically. So he asked me to pray over the guy. I prayed over him. He immediately manifested in a preternatural fashion. I told him to contact the diocese. In the end, the diocese asked me. So as soon as the diocese asked me, that's when I realized that, okay, this is what God wants me to do. I was hoping it was going to be temporary, but I ended up becoming their exorcist for about two years and then um, kind of still did it off and on. And then I did, um, uh, then when Bishop Slattery asked me to do it. Now it's my full time job. What has been your most harrowing experience with exorcism and what impact did it have in your spiritual life? Probably has to do with um, a particular case I've had. I've mentioned this actually in other public conferences. Uh, just recently, there was an hmm. interview by Chris Stefanik, which I did, but uh, I can kind of discuss it a little bit now because your viewers may not be familiar with that. But basically what happened was um, I was I had this one case that has that had Beelzebub as a possessor and he wouldn't obey me. He was just being obnoxious and he wouldn't do anything. So I got annoyed and I turned to God the Father and I said, punish him in a way that he's never been punished before. And so he just mm. went down on the ground. It was actually a woman who was possessed, but she went down on the ground, manifested that she completely changed into the shape of a man, started screaming. Um, but it wasn't that loud of a scream. It was probably not much louder than I'm talking now, but it reverberated throughout the whole church. The church, 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 even my sacristan went running out of the church because he thought we were having an earthquake or something. He went running out. And uh, what the most harrowing part about it was actually the fact that when I was looking at um, the face, the face of this mm -hmm. woman, which it's now morphed into the face of what Beelzebub would actually look like, I could see that um, two things. One is how exacting God's justice is, but then um, also that that's what hell looked like. And so it's the only time I've really been afraid and it wasn't that I was afraid of the demon, it was just actually I was afraid of looking at that like, that is serious. <laughs> so uh, that's that's the most harrowing situation I've ever had. I mean, demons do all sorts of things like threatening to kill you and stuff like that, but it's usually mm -hmm. idle threats. And we do a lot of praying in our community. As I mentioned, we pray three to four hours a day. So yes. there's a series of prayers that we do to keep ourselves protected and our lady's been very good in keeping us protected so that we don't have, you know, the same kinds of close calls that you might see or hear about. It, it was your baptism fire. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it was a real turning point for my spiritual life because I realized the seriousness of what I'm doing as an exorcist. The second is um, the reality of God's justice. Um, also, his mercy, because he's been, he was very merciful to mm. that woman, too. Woman, not girls, but... And so, it, it, over that, that was kind of set in motion a real long, uh, a very long um, reflection over the course of years on how just God is, but also that how merciful he is. So, both of those kind of how they interact and how they interplay. Um, but it's like anything with an exorcist. When you probably one of the best descriptions I ever heard of being an exorcist was uh, from a Roman exorcist. He said, "Being an exorcist is like living the Christian life writ large." It means wow. it's, it's so impacting. The, the church's teachings become so real to mm. you. You know, like for example, the reality of Christ's presence in the Eucharist, or the fact mm. that you know He shed His blood for us because the demons have this tremendous horror about regarding the blood of. Christ and things like mm -hmm. that, or just even facets of Christ, various parts of Christ's suffering, um, like one demon that I'm dealing with right now is one of the things that just completely crushes him is in having to reflect on how exhausted Christ was during the Passion, and yet he kept going and he kept doing what he needed to do. So it's things like that that it gives you a real sense of how true the Catholic faith actually is. And Father, can you discuss the significance of exorcism with the modern church right now and its confrontation with the reality of evil? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think there's two parts of it. I think there's a lot of people who are living life, sinful lives, mm. acting like evil doesn't exist or that hell doesn't exist because that's the one yeah. you get when you're, you know, when you're dealing with these things, they're in hell, right? And so you, you, you do get a sense of that. So I think that in our modern context, it brings back to the reality. I think the fact that exorcisms are increasing and the number of exorcists, at least in the United States, and I think even uh, worldwide to some degree, depending on where you're located. I know the Philippines has uh, so, you know, 
know, a number of them. So it's one of those things that uh, the fact that there's kind of this increase is a recognition that God's letting the reality of um, evil and how this stuff is actually there, despite the fact that in the modern world it's very easy to live your life as if evil doesn't exist or that I have to worry about sin or things of that sort, when in point in fact we actually do have to worry about those things and that we are um, and that hell is real. So I think, it, uh, and so I think that helps quite a bit for us, in, especially in the modern world, especially in technology, mm. uh, yeah. which is a good thing. It's not a bad thing, but it can sometimes cause us to think that you know this stuff is real, etc. And I and, and this really helps to drive home that it actually is very real. Mm. And speaking of the modern uh, technology, Father, uh, right now in in social media, especially in in our young generation. How, how can the devil use this modern technology to put curse or inflict someone? I mean, especially our young our young generation. Yeah, there's uh, there's quite a few different ways. Actually, that's a pretty, um, there's a lot of stuff. That's almost an interview on its own. <laughs> but it's <laughs> one of those things that, um, I, I'll just talk about a few of them. So one of the sure. things that started coming across to us is that um, Satanists would actually curse texts that they would send to people. We also know as exorcists, we're get, we've seen um, certain people come to us to be are being possessed because they're watching pornography online. Mm. And pornography is cursed. So the Satanists actually talk wow. to people who make pornography that if you curse the um, the master copy of the pornography when it made his copies are made when people watch, they can become if there's open doors etc. Mm. Usually just the pornography watch the pornography itself is an open door. They can become subject to the curse. And so we've actually seen men become possessed. And the part of the reason they do that is because it uh, boosts the addictiveness of the uh, addictive mm. dimension to the pornography. So then the guys become even more involved in the pornography, watching it, uh, and things of that sort. We're also seeing it, um, just the amount of um, uh, satanic uh, rituals and witchcraft are now being posted online to be talked about online. There's whole chat rooms, there's whole websites yeah. and stuff now, so it's kind of proliferating on that line. There's sometimes I'll get asked the question, is AI demonic and not in itself? Artificial mm. intelligence is just, it's a form of programming. It's still within the state of limitations determined by the programming and also the character set or the code set that's into the, in the machine itself, which can determine what it can and cannot do. So it ultimately boils down to what, how it's being programmed and also the data that's put into it because if you put certain kind of data in, you can get that kind of thing. So there can be demonic stuff to that, but it has to be with whether the data input is demonic or and or if the people are programming it specifically for that purpose. But outside of that, which is not that common, so outside that context, we just haven't seen it in that. But it's um, so technology, unfortunately, is a good thing. Um, mm. it's, it's a useful good, St. Thomas Aquinas calls it. It's just that it, it's like any other useful good. Uh, it can be used yes. for evil. It's also one of those proofs of the, the, of the principle that the more powerful a tool is, the more dangerous it can be, right? So it's one of those things that even though it does a tremendous amount of good, like this interview right here, um, it can also, people can use it for also very nefarious or very yeah. bad uh, purposes. How about uh, Father Chad uh, watching horror movies? movies is uh what can you say about that um i think it largely depends on the nature of the horror movie and what the person's uh, intention is behind it um if it's done in order to just uh have a certain level of entertainment and you're not there to get yourself all worked up emotionally yeah. like that i'm a little bit more benign and provided there's not something that's disordered in the thing but some but some people actually watch the horror movie because they really want to get excited and get moved, worked up emotionally but i think that uh, and some of them actually contain occult material or they contain things in it that are not healthy for us psychologically mm. so um i'm more concerned about uh the psychological impact even though those things can open the door to the demonic they don't necessarily do so by nature what specific guidance would you have to give catholics in the philippines on engaging in spiritual warfare and discernment uh, 
Yeah, there's two parts because you're talking about discerning, trying to discern, you know, if there's spiritual, what you're combating or what you're dealing with in your spiritual mm-hmm. life or in your day to day life is spiritual in nature, that is diabolic in nature. Um, there's two ways that you can actually do that. The first is, and this is the thing I recommend the most, is asking Our Lady of Sorrows. So just asking her on a daily basis, it, you know, feel to me if this is spiritual in nature and if it is what the na- what it is, what the nature of the demon is that I'm dealing with. Because in spiritual warfare, precision is everything. So when you can understand precisely the, the, the type of demon that you're combating, it's much easier to combat him. And a lot of mm-hmm. times they'll create diversions in one area of your spiritual life and then actually mm-hmm. in another. And so you want to just ask our native self reveal. It comes in the form of an ordinary grace. It's not going to be like some supernatural revelation. We're just going to grace to see this is what the problem is. So the first thing is, it's like any kind of warfare. You need reconnaissance. So you need to ask Our Lady, what's the what's the nature of the the demon that I'm dealing with? And then, as far as engaging in the spiritual warfare, once you kind of find out what that is, but even if you're just trying to keep yourself protected in the spiritual battle, or you're just trying to keep your family protected, the most efficacious thing that we have discovered in the last two years, even though I've been doing. Um, solemn exorcisms for 17 years. The thing that we have found the most effective is that what we're discovering is that most people lack an elementary discipline in their spiritual life. And by Mm. elementary, I mean elementary, but what does that actually look like? Well, what we're discovering is is that demons are attacking people precisely because people are what we, you know, what we would call soft targets. They're the types of people who they, they don't have good discipline, they don't have a lot of virtue, they're not really doing that much in their spiritual yeah. life and so the demons are attacking them because mm. the person is they know the person is less likely to respond with uh, and, and mm. some kind of a crushing manner to the demon so they type people like that whereas if a person has discipline and what's what's that discipline what we kind of noticed it is um and this is why we recommended doing the angelus six noon and six every single day and then saying the prayers of the abdu and christian arms so if a person did that every day the reason for the six noon and six is because you have to get up in the morning and so that requires requires um, discipline in order to do that. So the main thing that we discovered is it's, uh, it doesn't have to be that. It's just that we recommend that because it's a, it's a traditional practice that has been very um, beneficial for people. But uh, what we discovered is it's that every pra- that practicing self-denial each and every day in something Amen. that doesn't have to be anything big. Even if it's just like every day I'm going to stay away from some particular kind of food mm. that I really like or I'm going to cut down a little bit on how much I eat or every single day I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to do my prayers um, at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to do the angels or I'm going to do my prayers or I'm going to say the rosary every single day at a specific time. So mm. we found that it requires just um, every single day even just a little bit of self-denial. That mm. discipline that they build up is the most effective means of their protection. Um, wow. And just you know, because of the dynamics of the world today. I mean, obviously praying to our lady for protection and St. Yes. Michael and all those things are mm. key. Um, and as well, but this is one of the things that people can do on their own to keep themselves protected. But then also, if people are under attack, what we have found is doing that on a regular basis. If it's mm. um, if it's kind of like if it's a diabolic obsession or oppression, or even just temptations and things of that sort. But if so, if it's kind of lower level stuff, not possession, but if it's lower level stuff, we found if you do that on a regular basis over the course of time, it'll clear that out. So that's uh, it's just that elementary discipline is the thing that we're promoting the most now. But obviously, leading a Catholic life, making sure you are always in the state of grace, making sure you're getting the masses on Sundays and holding obligations to get the confession on a regular basis. Um, we were just talking before we started this, if you just said the rosary, saying the rosary mm-hmm. on a daily basis, those are the types of things that keep us protected. And so basically, leading an authentic Catholic life and staying Amen. out of mortal sin is your greatest protection. Uh, how frequent uh, do you recommend uh our viewers to go to confession, Father? Well, historically, what they would always say is that if you're um, getting to uh, confess, if you're not if you're not falling into moral sin, mm-hmm. getting to confession once a month is what they used to recommend. That was back in the 1950s, 1940s, at least here in the United States. Mm-hmm. So I think that was kind of a general recommendation worldwide in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. But I think this thing has gotten a little bit more, a little bit more difficult to, you know, we, um, to maintain your Catholic um, identity and practice and staying strong in a world that's getting worse and more 
people mm. and disordered and more secular and all of that. Yes. I usually recommend a little bit more if you're struggling with moral sin even more. But I, uh, a lot of times the, the people that are my spiritual directees, they will often go to confession once a week, not because they're committing mm. anything seriously bad, but just because the sacramental graces help them to yes. advance more rapidly in the spiritual life. So usually I think it just depends on the particular person where they're at in their spiritual life that if you're staying out of moral sin a minimum of once a month, if you're falling into moral sin, you get to it more frequently or get to it as soon as you fall, as soon as you can. But then, um, but if you're trying to advance your spiritual life once a week and once every two weeks, that's just my recommendation. Wow. Thank you so much, Father. And um, how do you view the deliverance practices in other religions? Do they hold any validity or efficacy? Okay, so there you have to make it, there's a threefold distinction in relationship to that. Mm. If you're talking about um, non-Jewish or non-Christian, our experience is just by observation. I'm not passing judgment on those religions, yes. I'm just saying by observation, they do not have, uh, we have not noticed any real success. In fact, usually it makes things worse. So one of the exorcists, with the first two years I was an exorcist, I would consult this one exorcist that lived in Trinidad, and he was probably one of the top exorcists worldwide. Mm. And and um, he, uh, he noticed that a lot of the Muslims were actually coming for help to him because mm. um, they said that their people, even though they would want to help liberate them, couldn't liberate them. And I do know that the Muslims actually have a process of exorcism, but I, my, my, my observation it's just not, it just doesn't have the efficacy that these others do. So if they're, if you talk about a non-Christian or non-Jewish, it's another matter. The Jews have actually had forms of exorcism all the way from the, before the time of Christ. Even Christ mm. said, if I'm casting them out by the power of the elves, well, who are you casting them out? Which is an indicator that the Jews were already doing forms of exorcism. In fact, their exorcisms are, are have, there's a lot of the Catholic practices, which actually was taken over by the Jews and purified and uh, mm -hmm. added to because of the our understanding in the Christian culture uh, and Christ's teaching. So it was amplified and given greater understanding, etc. But for example, one of the things that the Jews would often do is they would read parts of the Old Testament, like one of the Psalms, and they would just keep reading it over and over again. If the possession was in a particular location, they would take that part, they would write it out on a piece of paper, which we actually do once in a while too, and they'll hold it on the particular part of the person that's possessed. So the Jews, I think, have a certain amount of success of that. I don't think it's still on the level of even the Christians or the Catholics. The mm. Christians, Christ said, that by my name, you will cast out demons. And so as a result, Christ's name itself has a certain force, a spiritual force to it. And so um, we've noticed that among Protestants that they can drive out kind of low-level forms of even possession. And so they do have a certain kind of a modicum amount of, of success. The biggest thing that we've seen with them is that if they keep doing it for a certain amount of time, because they're not really operating within an authority structure like mm. you do in the Catholic Church, a lot of them end up themselves getting retaliated and getting attacked and end up with all sorts of problems, either with themselves or with their families. And so that's uh, what we're actually seeing. And so the Christians, we, we've noticed, you know, like the Protestants, they do have, uh, it's even more efficacy than, say, the Jews mm. or the, the non-Christians or the non-Jews um, as well. But yeah, but the, the, there are certain levels, there are certain kinds of possession, certain kinds of diabolic influence that are only going to be able to be broken by Catholic priests because Christ gave the church jurisdiction, yes. which is a of authority and the demons know they have to obey it and so it has a kind of an efficacy so um we don't see them too often but once in a while Protestants will actually show up on our doorstep because they can't seem to get liberated um and so we're able to to help liberate them a vast majority of them end up catholic but that's um but that's usually how it kind of works mm. and this is common uh, question here in the philippines uh father chad if i'm a father do i have an authority to perform deliverance over my family? 
Yes, actually, you do. So, demons actually, I talk about this in my book, Dominion, um, mm. which is, um, which you can get. I mean, I know you can even get it in the Philippines. It's just that shipping costs are just ridiculous, which I'll talk about that. There's actually a publisher that's um, just started publishing. Well, they published mm. some of my stuff in the past, but um, I, w- I would like to see them actually publish it in the Philippines, too, because I think it would be a, a good work yeah. to do. Mm. But, uh, but anyway, there's a book I wrote called Dominion. In there, there's a chapter on authority. So, if you actually look at the way demons actually function psychologically they also have a natural law and so built into their minds just as it is human beings as an understanding of the authority structure Mm. and so they recognize that for example that this authority structure is either in one of two ways either by the natural law so a father has natural right authority over his wife and his children the wife Mm. has a natural right authority over the children but not her husband so she can't bless her husband and she can't command the demons to leave her husband based Mm. on the authority but i'll get to that in just a minute but he does the father actually has the right because of his authority over the children and his wife to command the demons to leave his 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 wife Mm. and his children alone and so he can actually say prayers commanding the demons to leave and he can actually provide them a certain amount of spiritual protection he just has to make sure he and his own spiritual life is in order because he doesn't want to be doing this if he's leading a life of mortal sin or something. He yes. needs to get that cleaned up and then really hunker down and protect his wife. But the demons know that he has a right because of the natural law in relationship mm. to that. Because of the nature of marriage, when uh, the sacrament of matrimony, the two exchange bodily rights, that's the very mm. structure of marriage, that it's an exchange of bodily rights, it's a contract in which we enter into bodily rights. Um, even, at, even though the church talks about a covenant, the covenant is just a solemn contract, just according to the tradition. So, but basically what that means is that the wife actually has rights over the husband's body, so she can command the demons to leave in relationship to that. But she doesn't have the authority, so she does have the right to command the demons to leave over their husband's body because of the rights of marriage and so to be in relationship to her. Mm. But he has authority over her, and that's why he can actually command the demons to leave. But he can he can also bless her and the children. We see this from the time of the Old Testament all the way up through the New Testament, and in the church's practice. In some yes. cultures, it's still already very much practiced, and so we, we were constantly encouraging people. It was never much of a practice in the United States among the Catholics, but we we're encouraging. We're trying to get that built up mm. over here um but then also um she has she can also bless her children uh, from the office of mother because of the natural law rights of authority over the children you know as long mm. as they're made, uh, of the uh, their mothers so anyway that all being said um they do have that authority and so we really encourage the parents to provide the spiritual protection for the children by blessing them commanding the demons to leave them alone saying honors for their protection mm. um, it has a great deal of efficacy uh, does it work only to get married in the church? Uh, how about if the couple just get married in in civil wedding? Uh, if you're talking about Catholics, well, technically speaking, in the eyes of God, they're yes. not married. And so we've actually found that that's an open door to diabolic influence. We've actually seen this where people ask us to come to their house. We discover they're not actually married within the confines of the church, even though they're both Catholic. Uh-uh. And that's the actual cause of the dry diabolic stuff. But then mm. um, what we've just, what's very interesting is we actually keep statistics, which is funny. You wouldn't think exorcists would keep statistics. But we actually do because we're watching for patterns, because we're trying to figure out you know, how demons are functioning and where they're functioning mm. and why they're doing this. And one of the things that we actually discovered was is that 80% of problems in marriages are either because their marriage isn't valid and they need to get it sacramentally cleaned up, oh. or they're not following the natural law right order within the family where the husband's the head of the household, he's governing it, he's using his authority mm. not for his benefit, but he's using it for the benefit of the wife mm. uh, and, the, uh, and the children because he loves them and then the wife commits mm. in a rightly ordered way, not like a slave mm. or something like that, but in a rightly ordered way um, and and having a certain respect for his authority. Just doing those two things means that 80% of the diabolic influence we've seen in marriages. So, getting back to your original question, they don't um, even if they uh, if they do have children, technically speaking, they can bless. Yes. They really need to get their the children. The, the husband can't bless the woman he's had the children with because he's he technically in the eyes of God 
she is not his uh, wife. So he's got to get that straightened out. And that's one of the reasons why we encourage people, look, just get this straightened out, get to the church, get it cleaned up. And then from there, the graces will start flowing and the spiritual warfare is significantly, uh, uh, you, it's much better because you're just not fighting the demons because you, you don't have you don't have an open door in your marriage. Wow, thank you for sharing that. It will be helpful to our viewers who are uh, watching right now, Father. This is a problem that we're just seeing worldwide. You know, it's not even, it used to be like in certain cultures, like in South America and stuff, mm. you would see people living together more frequently or they yeah. would come up here and they would live, um, they would get married before. But I, um, I tell people, you know, the number of people just in the United States that live together before they get married is 98%. And of the Catholics, it's 97 Ooh. So we're not much better. So I tell Mm. People, look, this is a phenomenon that we're seeing worldwide, and it's something that uh, people really need to to address. And why do you think uh, even the good people sometimes undergo profound uh, experiences of evil? Well, the ultimate reason is twofold. Um, the first is I actually talk a little bit about this in the book Dominion, where I talk about the reason. There's 17 different reasons for possession, for example. Mm. But the primary, the two primary reasons are um, that. God will use the demons to draw the person back to him so that they have to fight their way out, they grow in virtue, they grow in holiness, um, and so they actually, and they have to depend on him more, they grow, they get, become much closer to him, and that's the principal reason why he actually allows it. So even in cases of possession, so two of the women I'm working with right now are some of the most holy people I've ever met, right? So because they have to, they have, they have to be, if mm. they're going to fight their way out of this, you know, it's either sink or swim, as they say. So she's, they they're doing what they're doing what they're supposed to be doing they're becoming very holy they don't necessarily see it that's fine but that's the point so and also even like with oppression where they're attacking people from the outside you know like attacking their finances their income their job yeah. situation their family relationships those kinds of things a lot of times demons will attack that and the only the primary way they used to the exorcist used to say that um that that was dealt with is the person just had, simply had to increase their spiritual life and their prayer life and go closer to God. And that would actually do it. And that's actually one of the things we still recommend. So it's a, a, the primary reason is for our sanctification. The demons, and they'll even admit it in session under duress, that they are the instrument of this person's becoming holy and gaining certain levels of virtue mm. that they wouldn't otherwise. The other part of it is, is we are instruments of justice to them. Yes. Because every time we come back them and fight them and defeat them, they're humiliated and God's justice has served them. And so this is uh, the two principal reasons um, why um, you'll, you'll see even the best of people, uh, the demons mm. will actually attack them. It's kind of funny because usually the demons, first of all, demons don't want to attack good people because they know they're likely to get beat up. However, yeah. Uh, we call it conscription. Sometimes God says, "Hey, go do your uh, job. You got to test. You, you have to test these these people." We call it conscription. So the demons are like, "Well, God told me I had to do it, so here I am." You know, even in cases of possession. Hmm. But a lot of times too, they'll still attack even good people with the hope of that they'll be able to kind of take them out. But hmm. I, I, that's one of the reasons why I tell people: if your life is hunky dory and you have absolutely no, um, you have absolutely no. Uh, diabolic meddling or any level of spiritual warfare whatsoever. That's not, that's not a good sign. Uh, there's always a certain the, the more good that you're doing, the more the demons are going to try and sabotage you. Yeah. And can you share how how your Marian devotion and the Rosary have supported supported you in your ministry on uh, exorcism? Yeah, as far as the Rosary itself, you know, Padre Pio used to refer, refer to it as the weapon. I mean, it was the one thing wow. that he would refer to, that he would always resort to um, mm -hmm. in order to gain um, protection from the diabolic. To, to he would pray the Rosary if he was being attacked, things of that sort. And so we have found the Rosary to be a particularly effective um, thing. And the uh, in in the spiritual battle mm. in our community, in addition to the regular rosary, we also say the uh, the servile rosary or the the, the adult rosary, which is um, a reflection on the seven sorrows. So there's uh, oh. seven decades. So there's seven um, Hail Marys said oh. uh, for for seven sorrows. 
the principal reason we do that, and this actually reason why our community is called Our Lady of the Society of the Most Powerful Mother, is because of the fact that um, when she appeared under that title, she said that if you have a devotion to her under that title, she will protect you and your family from the diabolic incursion. Mm. So obviously, a strong devotion to Our Lady is going to be one of the principal means by which you're going to maintain um, that protection. Uh, my entire life, I've had a very strong devotion to Our Lady. Um, from the very early time, my mom fostered it. My dad had a lifelong devotion to Our Lady. Um, and so and Our Lady's been very good, given, given signal graces in our family regarding our devotion to her. Um, I did the total consecration to Our Lady shortly after I was out of high school. That's been significant. It has a huge impact on deepening my spirituality, oh. providing the grace um, to you know advance my own spiritual mm. life, help overcome my own defects and things of that sort. So Our Lady plays a very key role, not just in the spiritual warfare, but in the advance of mm. our spiritual lives. And so obviously in our community, uh, we wouldn't even consider you to have a vocation unless you had a very strong devotion to her. Mm. And you, you said about signal grace, Father Chad. Uh, can you share a brief uh, explanation? Because many of our viewers are a bit confused about uh, signal graces. So, a signal grace is basically it's uh, it's basically a grace that God gives to you as an indicator that either He's pleased with what you're doing, or that what you're doing is um, that the particular devotion is a sign of predestination. I'll unpack um, each one of these a little bit, um, or that the devotion that you're practicing is pleasing to Him, or that He wants it to continue. So, for uh, so for example, an example of a signal grace in my own father's life. My father had a lifelong devotion to Our Lady. He prayed to her every single. He prayed to her every single night before he went to bed. Mm. He was born on the feast of the Presentation, which is February second. He died on the feast of. Um, he died the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Um, there were certain things that we were asking for my father to have a happy death. Our Lady fulfilled every single one of those. So those are kind of signal graces given to mm. my father that she had loved him and she would appreciate devotion and she was going to bring him to heaven type of thing. Um, there can also be signal graces like, for example, people can receive if they're, um, if they're destined to be like, say, um, a priest or a nun or something like that. God will give them indicators, graces, inclinations to doing certain things, developing certain practices, other people saying, you know, you'd be a good nun, that's me. So those can be kind of graces that kind of come outside outside that God will give to give you an indicator that this is what you're supposed to do. People have to be careful, though, because sometimes people can go to extremes and they, they something happens and they say, okay, God wants me to do X. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a little bit more discernment, yet sometimes it takes mm. a little bit of time. And that's mm. one of the reasons, again, I recommend the devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows because it's specifically under that title that she reveals certain things. And so I mm. tell people, pray to our media stars and ask her, what is it that her son wants you to do with your life? What is it that her son wants you to do as far as the next thing in your spiritual life to work on? But these signal graces, so for example, one of the things that they used to say is that saying the rosary every single day was mm. um, a sign of predestination. So it was a great, because to do it every day requires a grace. God already has to be the grace to maintain that practice practice for your life long. And so if you do that your whole life long, that's pretty a good sign that uh, it's her indication that the grace is necessary for your final perseverance and salvation will be assured. So this mm. is what, and so it was always uh, saying the rosary every single day was considered a sign of predestination to heaven. Our Lady does, there's other ones like that. So for example, I um, had a woman recently that I knew who, one of the signs I think of a single grace is that she was receiving throughout her life, even though I don't know if she really recognized recognized it very much is that she was given a grace to always have goodwill in virtually wow. every circumstance. And that's wow. just we human beings were, were prone mm. to, you know, beginning angry and mad and hurt. And mm. She just never did that. And so that um, benignity or that benevolence in her will consistently through her whole life, I think, is also kind of a signal grace. So signal grace are just um, graces God gives us. They're there for our sanctification, our building up our spiritual lives. Um, mm. But they can also also be an indicator of what God's will is for us regarding like our salvation or, or um, and we're not absolutely their signals they're not we're not absolutely certain about them yes. they just kind of give us an indicator um, another signal grace would be someone who um, you know 
for his whole life has always remained in the state of grace. It just, or even if he fell, he stopped, and then you know, for the last twenty years, he's always remained in the state of grace. He's maintained his Catholic life. That's kind of those are single graces as well. How can you share about your experience about Saint Michael Relic stuff? <laughs> oh yeah, that's great to have one. By the way, that's awesome to see. I'm glad you have one. Yeah, thank um, you, brother. So this is something I came across very early on in uh, my work as an exorcist. One of the exorcists that trains me gave me my first stone, if I remember right. Mm. Um, or maybe he told me to contact um, uh, the um, Shrine of St. Michael, which is in Gargano, Italy. This is where St. Michael appeared five times uh, to three separate archbishops, if I remember my history correctly. So he appeared in the cave, and he mm. told the bishops, the archbishops, that um, the cave was considered sacred ground, and that he wanted people to take the stone of it. So they're kind of like quasi relics of St. Michael. And those stones um, have tremendous uh, impact in our line of work. And I think they, they're great for people to get at because they actually provide people a lot of protection um, spiritually. But uh, the first time I really noticed its impact was I had a woman who was, um, I, in my own estimation, she had a very low level form of possession. She oh. was always trying to lead a good life with certain things. Oh. She was victimized in certain ways, and that was the open door. So she ended up becoming obsessed, but it was kind of low level stuff. And so she came to me for help. So um, I prayed over her three times. But the third time she prayed, I actually had just mm. gotten the stone. I said, Well, here, hold this. And so I started the um, exorcism of the positive angels by Leo XIII, which is actually a prayer to St. Michael. It starts out with a prayer to St. Michael. Mm. Um, and so I started out, I got a third of the way through that prayer to St. Michael as she was holding the stone. And both of us experienced just this popping sense. Wow. And um, we both kind of just jerked at the same time. And we finished the prayers, and from that point on, she was liberated. So it does have a tremendous impact. You see the demons can't stand it in session. It just drives them nuts. Wow. So it's a very powerful relic, and this is one of the reasons why we actually uh, recommend it. You can actually write them and get them. Usually you have to send a bit of a donation because they want to recoup their cost yeah. for the little mm. uh, feck that you had uh, Yes. and then also the cost of shipping. So usually mm -hmm. they, they'll, um, uh, if you're a priest and you're over there, they'll actually let you take larger parts of the stones and stuff, um, which is one of the reasons why at some point, I mean, I go to Italy from time to time, and one of these days I have to <laughs> I have to stop my schedule and just go down there. Um, I also have uh, obligations to Padre Pio because he's been so helpful in my uh, sessions and in our work that uh, I really should uh, thank him by getting down there to visit him at some point. Uh, even though I pray to him every day, practicing. Mm -hmm. He's actually one of the patrons of our society. But that's what I said, Michael. <laughs> but that, that stone is definitely worth something if people can obtain it. It does provide. It's not superstitious, obviously. Yes. But, you know, as long as you're leading Catholic um, life and you're using it in mm -hmm. devotion and with faith, it'll provide you a lot of protection. What type of uh, relic is this, Father? Is this first, second, third? <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it wouldn't be first class. His first class is if you actually had part of him. Well, he's a yes, spirit. Part. Right? It's not mm. going to be that. Uh, so, you, you know, it's not exactly, it's not a third class because third class implies that it's just something that's been touched. Yes. To a first class relic. So it's probably some form of a second class relic. Uh, um, and I think that's kind of generally how they're treated. Why do you think God allows uh, the devil, the devil possess a person? Um, well, as I mentioned, I don't know if it's in the lay version, but it's in the, the priest version. There's a pre priest can actually get a, um, a version of my. The, so the book I wrote was called Dominion, mm -hmm. but then there's a priest version which is 300 pages long or 280 pages actually. So it's 280 pages longer, and the reason is is because it's got all the diagnostic material. It goes into much more depth about the structure of the liberation process and the patterns that you'll see as people are liberated through each of the different kinds of diabolic influence. But uh, but in there I talk. To there's 17 different reasons why God allows someone to become possessed. And um, in, uh, in most cases, like I said, it's because God wants a person to become holy. 
Oh. There's other times where it's because there's a generational spirit, there's some kind of spirit in the family that mm. he's displeased with and he wants this thing out. And so he'll allow the possession to kind of come to the surface in order oh. for the, the to get this thing out of the family lineage or out of wow. the family tree, so to speak. Mm. He'll um, sometimes it's to um, to so something can be learned um, either by mm. the family, the person who's possessed, or by the exorcist, or even by the church in general um, in relationship to that. Um, a lot, as I mentioned, sometimes it's just to punish the demons. Like I got one case now where the demon um, he's possessing this woman, but he in the process of her becoming holy, he mm. has to watch her reach a level of holiness where she'll get his place in heaven as far as her level of sanctity. And so he just can't stand this woman. So he's the instrument of her sanctification to reach that. So there's a variety of different reasons. If you're talking about actual causes, why they become, there's three. The first is, is that the person commits a moral sin. So the person okay. commits a moral sin, mm. and as a result, the demon gets their foot in the door. Uh, not everybody who commits moral sin becomes possessed, but every moral sin, it can be an open door to possession. Mm. And sometimes uh, people are victimized or something, some great evil occurs to them, you know, so a lot of the ones that we see, at least here in the United States, are women who have been raped or molested or something like that, and oh. they've become possessed as a result. And a lot of people say, well, that's not very fair. And like, well, no, it's not. Those are precisely the women who become very mm. holy. They develop a strong sense of forgiveness um, for the people who did it against them, but actually pray for the person's conversion. You'll see, you'll see a tremendous um, growth in the person's mm. spiritual life. But so something greatly has occurred to them, and that's about half our caseload actually and then there's a very small percentage i've never personally seen a case of it i've only read of cases of it and that's where the person becomes possessed either or neither because someone's done something gravely against them mm. or because they've committed a mortal sin so there was a case of a nun in iowa here in the united states making mm. to became possessed as a result um at the, well at once the exorcist got to the point where he was able to command the demon to tell him, how did you get in and um uh, you know, why, what did this woman commit, a, did this nun commit the moral sin? He said, no. And he said, well, why are you here? And he said, because there's a sin in the region and God wants reparation. Mm. The reparation was for the sin of divorce in the mm. region there in Iowa. And so the bishop mm. set up uh, Eucharistic adoration and about two days later the woman was liberated yeah. um, once God had felt that the reparation had been made. So, but those are extraordinarily rare. I've only read of a couple of those cases, but the rest of them are because people either commit mortal sin or some grave evil has been committed against them. And why do you think, Father Chad, that most of the victim of possession is a uh, woman? <laughs> I think there's well, I should say there's two reasons why we see more women than men. Yeah. And that's, by the way, that's my experience. That's most exorcist experience. Ooh. I do have a close friend who's probably one of the best exorcists in the country. And uh. he, he uh, that's just not his experience. It's mostly men. But I think he's kind of the anomaly. Most of them see women. I think there's two reasons. One is because women are more victimizable. They're, they're easily to prey upon than men as a uh. general rule. So I think there's that. That's just a failure of men to keep them protected. But the uh, other part of it is, uh, and this is what I always say, is that women will actually stop and ask for directions. In other words, women are more likely to ask for help than men are. So we see guys that are possessed, but a lot of times they won't seek out for help because, you know, it's unmanly or it's, or, you know, yes, yes. Me or what have human respect or all sorts of other different reasons. And so a lot of times you'll see that uh, mm. actually happening in relationship to the men. So I think less men ask for help, but I also think less men are victimized. However, as to the number of possessions, I think that you're starting to see a rise among the men, particularly because of that, that issue of pornography being cursed and things of that sort. Mm. So I think you're seeing kind of a rise among the men, but I still think that women predominate. Uh, the demons will sometimes say under duress that one of the reasons they like to attack women or possess women is because of their hatred for the Blessed Virgin Mary and the women are in that same image. Whoa. It's nice to know that, Father Chad. And Father, what spiritual uh, and mental preparation do you undertake before an exorcism? And what practices would you recommend to others facing spiritual adversities? Um, so we 
Um, well, first of all, we go to confession pretty frequently, and we just try mm-hmm. to do it once a week if we can. But the other thing is, so that's part of it, just be going into, and that's one of the church's recommendation. Um, during session weeks, I also pass uh, six days a week on one meal a day for six oh. days. So there's mm-hmm. that. Uh, so we do fasting, um, and then our prayer life, as I mentioned, we pray three to four hours a day, and so we wow. um, we do a lot of meditation, which helps with diabolic attacks when they attack us, or emotionally mm-hmm. or psychologically. So that helps keep us strong and it minimizes those. We also say a set of prayers for our society. Each priest mm-hmm. says a set of prayers that keep. They're all designed to keep us protected in that actual um, process. Um, we're also a lot of the priests take on this specific devotions, especially if mm-hmm. um, they're like particular saints comes to the surface as the nemesis, the demon, or a particular aspect of Our Lady, like if, under a particular title. So um, uh, recently I've been working on a case that has, um, it, uh, it's Our Lady's title, of Year of Justice. So I've been doing a lot uh-huh. of prayer and reflection on that and develop a devotion to that. The Virgin Most Powerful is one of them that we see quite a bit. So uh, it, a lot of it is just making sure that um, our prayer life is consistent, that we're practicing that self-denial, that self-discipline, as I mentioned. Mm. Or on a consistent basis, but the meditation, the daily rosary, and then those prayers, and then um, we find that that, in addition to the mass and office, are the things that provide us the most amount of tent protection. And so, before we even go to sessions, a lot of times we are spiritually prepared because by the time I get to a session, I've probably paid for at least an hour, in some cases up to two hours before I even start mm. a session. So there's uh, a, a lot of pure spiritual preparation beforehand. And then when we start the session, before we actually begin the solemn light of exorcism, there's uh, a one prayer that we pray specifically for our, our protection and everyone else is like our lay assistants that mm. are present for their protection. So we say, and for the person who's possessed, we pray for our protection. And then there's a series of prayers we do to lock the demons down so they can't do certain things. And then at the end, we actually say prayers against retaliation so the demons can't come after us and retaliate because they're unhappy because they took their beating, so to speak. But then, um, as far as lay people go, I think the main thing, as I mentioned, is living a good Catholic life, staying in the state of grace, giving to Mass mm-hmm. regularly, and getting to confession regularly, but then maintaining a regular prayer life. So, uh, uh, you know, as I've mentioned, praying the rosary every day. But then also, if you can do 15 to 30 minutes of meditation every day, that will make a huge difference in being able to deal with the psychological um, attacks the demons will very often, or even the temptations. Um, and also, by doing the meditative meditation, um, and also fasting, if you're finding that you really got a lot of spiritual warfare during mm. fasting, or um, abstinence and things like that will help quite a bit. But uh, that daily meditation is one of the principal ways that we find that people maintain that interior peace, and yes. when the attacks come, they're very quick to mm. recognize it as an attack, because they're very uh, spiritually um, sensitive and prepared, because they're daily meditation mm. and then um uh and also the rosary and the rosary gives them the strength to do it so we found those are the principal some of the principal means and uh in your extensive ex- extensive experience in spiritual warfare and exorcism how do you perceive the difference between the latin mass and the novus ordo in terms of oh. spiritual efficacy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I've actually debate. written on what I actually say. I actually think that you can you can cite objective criteria to show that on an objective level, not necessarily subjective, on an objective level, that the old mass actually does provide a certain level of protection that you're not going to see in the new. Just by way of observation, I can honestly say that di- that people who are possessed find it more difficult to go to the old mass than the new. And um, the reason for that is because, and the demons will admit as much in sex, that it's the sacredness and the reverence and also just the fact that the prayers have been around the prayer of the church for almost 2,000 years, some of them uh-huh. at least 1,400 years since the time of St. Gregory Great. It's precisely for those reasons the demons find them so painful and difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, it doesn't mean that the Noah's Ark is evil. Or anything. It just means that we have just, it's just by way of observation, we've noticed it's harder for the demons to sustain being 
in the traditional Latin masses as wow. a result of people find it harder to be there as a general. Wow, thank you for sharing that, Father. Sure. And that's the common question I always heard from our viewers. So mga faith, a quick promotion lang ng bagong libro nit ni Brother Bo Sanchez. Uh, multiple income streams, how I created seven money machine and how you can to buy Brother Bo Sanchez. At kung di nyo po kilala si Brother Bo Sanchez, sino bang hindi nakakilala sa kanya na isang sikat na Catholic preacher, influencer at motivational speaker. At kilala rin si Brother Bo Sanchez na isang magaling na financial teacher. Kaya sinulat niya itong multiple income streams. Good news mga faith na itong librong ito ni Brother Bo Sanchez ay libre lang po ito. So this is for free. Pinamimigay niya to ng libre sa mga interested po na magkaroon ng libreng copy ng librong ito ni Brother Bo Sanchez. Alam nyo, nung binabasa ko to, ang dami ko natutunan dito na mga teachings ni Brother Bo. Siya yung Naging way at naging dahilan para magawa kong full time itong ginagawa ko bilang isang uh, online content creator. Dahil doon nakapag build ako ng apat na sources of income kaya ako nagagawa itong ginagawa ko ngayon. At yung mga teachings na yun ay nandito sa libreng libro na to ni Brother Bo Sanchez. Para magkaroon kayo ng libreng copy na to, ilalagay ko yung link sa taas or sa baba ng video na to. Kailangan nyo lang ay sagutin yung shipping fee. Pwedeng through credit card or kung Gcash kayo magbabayad, piliin nyo lang yung Dragon Pay. Makikita nyo option dyan. Thank you and God bless. We will entertain some of the question from Jessica Milag. Father Chad, I've heard that witches in America perform a black mass on November 1st to curse people. Is this true? Um, I'm not really sure about the specifics of it, but usually uh, they will do they will do black masses on November 1st. Um, you know, a lot of times they they say that they're like their their Easter is um, Halloween. That's that's true. There, it is an important feast for them, but actually there's other feast during uh, the course of the year that they'll actually do those things and so um november 1st is one of them that we've actually mm. seen but usually the the dates that the satanists and the witches do the most rituals are the days before major marian feasts those oh, seem to be the ones that that in their calendar they consider the most important and the most efficacious on their side of the equation are the ones the day before a major Marian feast. This is one of the reasons why a lot of times people who are possessed will find the day before a major Marian feast they're just a mess. They have a hard time functioning, the demons are attacking them, they're just going nuts. And then on the actual Marian feast everything kind of calms down and everything's fine. So, um, but I have heard that, um, and I, you know, <laughs> they're probably doing them every day. But uh, so, in November first, yes, I have heard that. Oh, there will be a, a Marian feast approaching December eight, so they will um, perform. Yeah, so like December, so like December seventh is when they would do a major wind up on their feast days. Um, the feast of the Annunciation in March is one of the big ones. The day before is one of the big ones. Oh. Um, they might even, if I'm not mistaken, though, I could be. They might actually do it on March 23rd because March 24th is Saint Gabriel, and they don't like that. E but they might oh. still be doing that. I'd have that's something I'd have to check. But they usually do it. But I know the feast of the Annunciation is one of their major ones. Um, mm. The feast of the Assumption the day before the Feast of the Assumption. This is actually one of the reasons why I wonder if the church's original practice of having um, vigil days on the day before mm. the major Mary Feast is actually yes. important, or major feast days, but we have vigils where people actually do eight days of penance. Um, and I'd like to see that the church kind of go back to that practice for requiring it, because then it would help uh, mitigate that side of things, but it would also um, uh, make reparation, I think, for those things that are different. Mm. And from early Linda Hofer, Father, is, is, it, is it true that evil spirit exists in other parts of the universe such as on other planets that they may appear to us as aliens or are they only present here on Earth? That's actually a really good question. Okay, so um, the uh, the general consensus among the, uh, the exorcists is 
that they, they, they you'll, I, I've never seen them because they know, I think it's, I know what they're up to if they do it. So they don't appear uh, that way. They, demons will test people and do certain things when they, when they think you don't know something. So there are, there were, and, and you only see this among inexperienced exorcists where they'll manifest like the, like the, the what we would view as alien big eyes and round head and all that mm. and um they claim that they're like this they're not they're they're not angels they're not demons they're kind of this middle ground and that's just not true they're just demons that's that's just what they're actually doing do you know the the earth um at least according to the fathers and as and i think one of the things that do do they exist on other planets uh they're not the demons do they but do they uh, they do know do they pay attention to the planets mm, probably not because of the fact that they know that this, the earth, is the center of the spiritual warfare. This is where um, the spiritual and more center of the universe, uh-huh. even if it's not the physical center, it's, this is where the primary battle and God's activity and everything is happening. So this is where they keep their focus. And my experience in dealing with them is they don't pay attention to any of that stuff. They're just their my primary focus is what's going on here. Hmm. And from Janet, uh, Father Ripperger, is it safe to watch television shows where priests perform exorcism rites on people who are allegedly possessed, exhibiting behaviors like screaming, levitating, and speaking Latin words? There is uh, three parts to that answer. Mm. The Vatican has forbidden the videotaping of oh. any exorcisms done by a Catholic priest. So if someone else is doing it that's not Catholic, that's, I mean, but the Catholic Church, the, the Vatican itself has said no you're not supposed to do that there's a whole series of reasons why that's that's the case they you are permitted to audio tape them for study purposes so the only time i've ever uh there's only two times i've ever recorded something it's because the demon was speaking in a language i couldn't understand um and so we would record it and then have someone who's a linguistic expert say okay it's this language but it means this or that mm. so that that's the only time that we ever used it um if you're talking about representing them on screen, uh, the Vatican does not have any restrictions on that. So the person isn't actually possessed, but you're just, um, you know, it's like shooting a movie, you're shooting a film, and so this is what it's looking like. You're not actually filming an actual possession, exorcism that's going on. Um, that would be another matter. Should people watch it? Uh, if your intention is to actually learn and to become knowledgeable about these things, that's then perhaps. But if you're doing it out of curiosity, you want to see the things that are, you know, otherworldly stuff like that, that can be an open door. You can get yourself in trouble spiritually for that. Um, mm. And then uh, the other um, would be. If they're, re- if they're re- kind of creating, representing some actual historical event, that's mm. one thing. But if they're and then, or if they're just doing a movie that's just kind of made up, that would fall under the same category as the second one. You know, if you're, you know, I wouldn't necessarily try and learn my theology from a movie, um, especially about how spiritual warfare works, because most of the time they get it wrong. I mean, the movie *Nefarious* is about as close as you're going to get, I think. But um, and actually, that's a movie that would be good for people to watch because they actually learn how demons interact by yes. logic and how mm. they manipulate people, etc. So that you. would mm. actually be good. So there's certain ones that can actually be beneficial for people to watch for their education, but they have to just be, care- be careful they're not doing it for curiosity's sake because they want to get the thrill out of seeing something that's otherworldly. Mm. And what can you say about po- the Pope's exorcist? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I, I couldn't bring myself to even watch the movie. I did see several of the trailers, and I did watch an extended trailer. I think it was like five minutes long, and I, I could hardly get through because the problem is is that Robert Morth, who is probably the father of modern day mm. exorcism in the church, because he was even though Father Ken D, um, and even before him, there was another exorcist who Father Morth considered probably one of the top exorcists mm. in, in history. Right. Um, but he trained Father Candido, and then Father Candido trained, trained, trained Father Amorth. But, um, you know, the, the Father Amorth is supposed to be it's based on the life of Father Amorth. There's nothing about that movie whatsoever that has anything to do with, with that. And uh. so the movie is, is so divergent from a how things actually happen yes. that I tell people just, you know, it's. I wouldn't waste my time even watching. I, I just, I never bothered watching. Mm. 
Yeah, I, 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 I watch it, Father. I think it's more on entertainment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not. <laughs> and it's when I watch the, the trailer, I'm like, it's entertainment. It's not even that good of entertainment. I, this is one of the things I've talked to some people that I actually know in Hollywood. I tell them, you know, what you guys can, your creative license never compares to what I've seen in real life. So don't even bother trying to. You know, I'm going to spice this up. No, you're just going to dumb it down. So if they would just portray what actually does happen, that's actually more, uh, you know, more educational and more, uh, mm. entertaining is probably not the right word, but it's more, you know, captivating i would say hmm. and there's a part there father chad that the uh, possessed person and the russell crow commanded the uh, the demon on that possessed person to go to a pig and right. then he uh, he killed the pig so uh, is this uh, a practice <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I always felt far, sorry for the guy that had all the pigs made in the Gospels, right? Because he's, he lost his whole herd. And they, they say it was like thousands of pigs he lost. So I'm like, wow. I can see why he asked for I take it to go somewhere else. I mean, not that he should have, obviously, because he, he's our Lord and he would want him present. But this, the, uh, there's two parts that why Christ allowed it. Because mm. the when they asked to go into the pigs, the first is um, to show us that demons can infest, that is, take possession mm. of animals and inanimate objects. Mm. They can do that under certain circumstances. And so um, we just have to kind of be aware of that. It's not very common. I've only seen it a few times, but it does actually happen. Mm. Usually they try and kill animals more than they do anything else. And then, so, uh, but the second, so that the first is to let us know, hey, they can still actually do this. The second part of it is to show us in the killing of the pigs that the that the demons are um, uh, they're just bent on destruction. It doesn't matter. Even if they get something good, they never retain it. They just destroy it again. Mm. They're compulsive in that regard. So once they got into the pigs, they just drove them into the water, and then that that was just a sign that that's um, the pigs just in the Latin phrase is animus delendi. They just have this desire to destroy everything they get their hands on, and they just can't seem to help it. Now, mm. one of the things that I do observe, too, is that there was a humiliation. The pigs asked, they asked to go into the pigs, but the re one of the reasons Christ allowed them to go into the pigs is because in the Jewish religion, the pigs were low-level creatures. I mean, they were oh. it was basically entering into, mm. you, know, you know, the lowest of the low kind of a thing, and so there was a kind of a humiliation um, or an embarrassment in that sense. So that's one of the reasons Christ actually allowed it, is for their humiliation. Mm. On the other hand, but the primary reason was to teach us they can't afflict animals and they can't inf and infest things. Thank you so much for that, Father. And from Adet, uh, Father Reperger, what immediate action should be taken if a demonic possession or manifestation occurs in a public setting such as inside a classroom where there is no exorcist available? The school administration does not acknowledge demonic possession and even the local parish priest is an unbeliever in such occurrences. Yeah, that's a really good question because it's not that uncommon. Not necessarily that the that you would see um, a preternatural manifestation like in a classroom. Mm. Although it does happen from time to time. Usually, my recommendation to uh, if you find yourself in a situation like that, is just uh -huh. stop everything. Especially if you're praying out loud, stop that because that's what the demons reacting to and coming to the surface. And then just start praying quietly, asking Our Lady to quiet everything down, to get everything, to settle everything down. And just pray quietly to Our Lady and just kind of leave it at that to quieten the situation down. Once the um, the manifestation stops, it's, the manifestation is called the period of crisis. Once the period of crisis stops, and the period of lucidity, that's where the person kind of comes to and you can kind of address them. Then my recommendation is even if the school doesn't believe it, even if the um, parish priest is, is, the, is the in it, like in the Philippines, I know there's a lot of priests that actually do believe in it and actually do yes. be a mm. approach. So, you know, talk to either the chancery or some of the priests that you know um, mm. and ask that and get the person some help. You know, to try mm. to get them to that priest so that he can begin the process of getting them liberated. Oh. I'm from Mayfair. Uh, good evening, Brother Adrian. I hope my question can be included to Father Chad. How do we combat demonic oppression? There are times when I feel very afraid, even though I have overcome it. I've experienced it twice while praying the rosary. The first time, a demonic figure resembling a monster appeared before me. 
but I wasn't scared because my child was awake at around 11 p.m. The second time around 2 a.m., I was wide awake and I, f and I felt a warning from God. So I started praying while lying down due to extreme fatigue and sleepiness. As I reached the third decade, a demon suddenly appeared and my fear was overwhelming. I prayed to St. Michael to block it. And then as I prayed the Hail Mary, it didn't seem to intervene. Okay. Uh, if the person is experiencing those things um, from time to time, then what that's a sign of is that they haven't gotten their foot in the door. The demons are trying mm. to get into him, and so that it's a good sign that they're not in yet. But it's also a sign that there's something that needs to be addressed because they're kind of lurking about. So that's when I would ask our native sorrows, you know, reveal to me um, what I've got to do to get my life straightened out. So, and, and sometimes it can be something very minor. Sometimes it can also be because someone in the area or in the family or something like that is engaging in, mm. in occult activities, and so you're just kind of on the receiving end of this. But usually the most effective thing that I've seen is something which um, we discovered in a particular case where the demon said, you will not break the oppression or the possession until you break the oppression. So I mm. said, okay, then you're going to tell us what it's going to do to break oppression. Now, as I mentioned before, oppression, when I was first trained as an exorcist, the exorcist who trained me and the stuff I read from Father Amor to all the exorcists, which is true, is you just increase your prayer life to persons who is being oppressed, just increase your prayer life, which I would still recommend as well, but increase your prayer life, start becoming disciplined in your prayer life like that mentioned before and doing that on a regular basis and then what you'll find is that that will slowly kind of get it to taper off and keep it at bay however mm. at a certain point i'd be out of him okay what do you got to do to stop this and he just said well you just have to command us to leave and we'll leave which is true um I, there's a conference where i actually talk more about this at length if people want to listen to it on youtube but then he would go from thing to thing and so i said well how do you stop that and he said well look as long as you retain the rights over your possessions christ will give us a certain amount of access but if you Amen. consecrate them to our lady and give them entirely mm -hmm. to her now that doesn't mean by the way that you're not the steward of these things or that you don't take care of them or use them for your own necessities and things of that sort but if you give them entirely to her he said once she accepts them we cannot touch them so in the prayer uh, deliverance prayers to the laity which is a book that i've written and actually it actually it's oh yeah of, i know that <laughs> So by yeah, yeah. following, so uh, it's actually printed right there. Um, we did, we let them print this there. It's the only other place in the world to get some yes, printed, by yes, the way. I, I know the that, reason uh, we did it is because it makes it uh, affordable for the people in the Philippines. Because obviously mm. getting books from the United States over there is just cost prohibitive. But in this book, is um, it's called uh, Consecration of One's Exterior Goods to Our Lady. And if you consecrate your exterior things, like your sleep, or just your house, your presence, um, or what have you, um, or even the things that the demons you think are attacking, if you consecrate those, once you do that, uh, what we noticed is there would be an immediate cessation of the activity. Ooh. And if you keep doing that consecration every day, a lot of times that will just stop it altogether and you're just not oh. going to have to deal with it. Mm. Uh, follow up on that question, Father. Is it possible that he has a third eye, the, uh, the one who asked that question? Because he see demons. Uh, she see demons. Yeah, I mean, seeing them, that is the, all the exorcists put that in the category of um, mm. oppression because it's outside. If they were attacking her interiorly, she would be she would be emotionally being attacked and psychologically being attacked. Or this is something on the outside, and the reason they're doing that is to try and get and the is to get her to, to obsess about it or get concerned about it. And so, in that particular case, it's not obsession because they haven't gotten their foot in the door, which is a good sign. Mm. Um, they're just trying to do stuff externally. So if she just um, concentrates or external presence or her house or she, or she feels these things are occurring like her bedroom or things like that. If she does that, then a lot of times that will, it'll stop there. Mm. And speaking of third eye, Father Chad, what is the difference between the third eye and a charism? Um, 
Okay, back to the back to the third eye. Uh, the, the part of the difficulty with the third eye is so sometimes people can actually be seeing demons legitimately, you know, mm. and it's not a matter of the third eye in the sense because the third eye is more of an occult thing where the demons act on um, that particular part of the brain, so the person, and that part, and the, and it's the part of the brain that's in the front. So that's why they put yes. it in the middle mm. um, in order for the person to, to influence them so that they think they see certain things. So the third eye is one of those things that doesn't really give you a true access into the spiritual realm in my, my observations and experience mm. watching that stuff happen and people experiencing it. It usually it's usually just a way for the demons to kind of feed stuff to people. It's also the inversion of oh. baptismal um, the seal on the soul oh. of baptism. So that's one of the reasons why the, the, the person is sealed here at the time of their baptism um, oh. and also at the time of their confirmation. So that's this, the reason it's done there. And that, so the third eye is considered the inversion of that. Why is it the third eye? Well, is it the inversion of it? It's because it's through um, baptism and confirmation that we receive the Holy Spirit, which gives us the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which gives us knowledge about God and the things that pertain to mm. spiritual life, etc. And so the third eye is like the diabolic inversion of that. And so that's one of the reasons why I tell people if, they're, if they've ever had been meddling in relationship with the third eye or they, they feel that that's actually happening, they can talk to a priest who can actually do some prayers over them to stop the demons from acting on them in that particular manner. Hmm. And how about a, a charisma father? Um, yeah, okay. It, so, so third eye is demons giving people information. Now, hmm. sometimes they can give people information about stuff that's actually active, but a lot of times it's, it's partially accurate and not fully accurate. Um, whereas the myth great which God infuses in the intellect or in the will, but it's usually in the intellect. And so, like, for example, in discernment of spirits, mm. um, it, it, it's a it's grace of God infuses in the intellect by which the person is able to know uh, mm. with certitude what the nature is of the spiritual thing that's present. And that can be in a variety of different ways. So I've seen some people actually have a charism. I, I, I've actually written books on charismatic graces where I say these things do exist, but they're not as common as everybody likes to think, and you mm -hmm. can't trust them and get them, etc. There's a there's a structure that the church has always understood how people receive them. Um, mm -hmm. It's not well understood today. But um, that being the case, I have seen them, everything from people just being knowledgeable about, I think there's a spirit of anger here, or what have you. Uh, um, but I've also, and it, so it kind of runs a bit of a gamut, but there's a, usually a degree of certitude in there, and one of the ways you'll know it's a true charism is, they're right almost every time, all, in fact, um, all the time, it's, it's especially when it gets to the higher forms of that charismatic grace. Whereas when you get people who say, well, I've got the gift of the of spirits, but they're wrong half the time. Well, that's not a gift. That's more like intuition. It can be grace uh, at times. So I'm not necessarily saying you should ignore those things. I'm just saying that it's you have to be careful in uh, ascribing it to charismatic grace. I did know a woman who actually had a charismatic grace of discernment of spirits. You can just tell her, mm. I know a woman who's 40 years of age that I'm working with. That's all you would have to say. Mm. To tell you how many demons they were, what their names were, how they got in, where they're located in the body, most likely what's going to get them out, what they're sensitive to, etc. And she was never wrong, right? Ooh. And one time I asked her, well, how do you know this? And she said, well, you mention the person, and then all of a sudden I have an image, and I see it, and I start describing it. Um, wow. And so we stopped using her. We only used her for on a couple of cases, and we stopped using her because even though she had a charismatic grace, her spiritual life, we just significantly improve to get to the point where she could sustain the spiritual warfare that was involved in mm. making use of that gift. So, um, that being said, the charismatic grace gives you knowledge. It's from God. It's from the Holy Spirit, and it has a degree of certitude. That's actually how you would discern it from side to say, like a third eye or a diabolic or a cult knowledge. The mm. charismatic grace is always going to be right. The, the diabolic side is going to be right a lot of the times, but not always. I see. And from Erwin Balagot, hello, Adrian. Could you please ask Father Chad whether the supposed so secret society known as the Illuminati truly exists and if they indeed worship the evil ones, as some people claim? Furthermore, were they intentionally created to sway public opinion as a part of what we refer to as a spiritual warfare? 
Okay, uh, there's two aspects to that question. The first, are there an Illuminati? The answer is actually yes, but it's there's that term is being used two different ways publicly right now. Mm. The original Illuminati were a part of the Freemasons uh, in the 1700s, uh. at least a certain level. Um, and they they segmented off from the Freemasons, even though they remained in the Supermason, and they basically formed a group which hold which its, its goal was. And by the way, this is there's public testimony about this. You can find documents they openly talk about mm. this stuff themselves um but it's documents that we found later and things like that that their goal was to influence the flow of human history especially mm. in the geopolitical realm and things like that um and so yes they are there how much of the illuminati are still present um i've read an enormous amount of stuff on that um i my my in my opinion is they are still there they're not as, as organized as they used to be um it's the information about them is not clear in other words mm. in the sense that you don't get a certitude about where they're present who's actually part of it etc yeah. you don't get that sense because even some of the world figures that are the top of the head of the head of it so like the head of the mm. wf Schwab or even the you know some of the high political figures people say well mm. these part of the illuminati well it's hard to tell you you, you would perhaps be, never be able to know there's question about whether ultra rich people are part of it yes. and that seems to be probably more likely the case but you can't have certitude about this stuff precisely because it's a secret society or secret group of people and so do they have an influence yes they are but it's hard to track them that's one of the geniuses of them it's hard to know exactly with clarity who is who isn't how much of it is still there what are they doing etc mm. a lot of times we only really know because of the fact that they, they start moving things along and then we say okay this is where it's headed so there's that there's also the term illuminati is also being used by by um, a group of people. So this needs a bit of background. This is going to mm. sound like conspiracy theory, but it actually was revealed in the documents, the MK Ultra documents that um, Trump required them to release. So what happened is, is when the, the during the Second World War, when the Nazis fell, the United States um, and, uh, and uh, Russia as well, but the United States under a, 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 there was a um, a military activity called Operation Paperclip. It's a well-known mm. thing. You get information on the thing. But what they did is they brought some of the best scientists from Germany over to the United States. They expunged their war crimes. And one of them was a guy by the name of Green. Now, Green was the guy that was put in charge by Hitler to master a particular oh. thing that the Nazis had caught wind of, oh. which is the between 1600 mm. and 1900, the Satanists had discovered that if you traumatize people to a certain level, it causes dissociation and fractures of personality. Yes. And then once the personality is fractured, this, mm. is what, this is what the goal of satanic ritual abuse is. Once it's fractured, you can take the alternates or parts. It's called, uh, it used to be called multiple personality disorder. It's a well known phenomenon. It's chronicled. The psychologist mm. already know its structure and all of that. Um, but now it's called disassociated energy disorder, which I think is a better nomination. What they discovered is this mechanism that you can actually train some of the alternates. Well, the Satanists had discovered that if you traumatize young kids, then you can train them to, uh, when you traumatize them, they go into this alternate. You train that alternate to be very submissive, very participant. Wow. They don't know what happens when they yeah. come back out of it, and so you can do their satanic ritual abuses on them to this. Well, they taught that the Gnostic caught wind of it. It was then um, Green was the guy who was put in charge to perfect this associative disorder in inducing it. The United States brought him over here under um, uh, Operation Paperclip. They began um, a a program called MK Alter, which the documents mm. are now on scene. So this is not conspiracy theory. You can read the documents yourself mm. They're right online. And the he they brought him over here to help perfect that, and the military in the United States got involved. According to the documents, they kind of gave up on it at a certain point because it was just unreliable as mm. far as being able to train, say, somebody to the Manchurian candidate is the movie that it's based on. Um, it's based on these this uh, activity that was done. Well, the problem is that, and this is another thing that's well known, it's chronicled, you can read it all, uh, you can actually read about it online, there's some books that mm. talk about the CIA is actually even admitted that they're trying to be this revolving door with certain people in Hollywood and things like that. 
like that and in the music and the entertainment industry. And so that mechanism that was learned in dissociating people um, was taught to some of the people in the music industry and in Hollywood. Again, yeah. this is not conspiracy theory. You can read this stuff right online and you can verify it by various sources. It's also in the actual documents, the MPL yes. documents. Okay, so that being the case, what happened is, is the people who that this was that these the, the methods of dissociating people used on them uh, it was used on certain people in the music industry and in Hollywood they um, they took on the name of the Illuminati and so they actually would talk about it um, openly about actually having gone through these rituals Lady Gaga talked about it yeah um, there's been a couple of other people that have talked about it mm. they haven't gone through these rituals um, etc so the Illuminati so sometimes you'll hear people in Hollywood or in the music industry or kind of in the lower fair talk about yeah I'm one of the Illuminati but it actually just means I've gone through this ritual mm. that's a different thing from the actual Illuminati that are part of the geopolitical thing um, it's again it seems to be pretty clear from the documentation they're there what they're doing who they are and stuff is I think difficult to prove mm. and father do you think that Hitler is possessed by the devil um, if the um, so the movie uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose is based on a woman by the name of Annalise Michelle mm, yeah. she was actually a very devout German who became uh -huh. possessed um, in the latter part of the 60s and early 1970s and um, one of the possessors claims that then um, Hitler but also um, in some of the accounts I can't get clear on it claims to be the spirit possessed Hitler um, Hitler did show some of the secondary signs but without actually praying for him, it would be uh, very difficult to prove when demons can lie so it's hard to know um, is he it is is his behavior that well his behavior kind of reveals it but that doesn't matter but that um you could be people can be evil um, mm. and pretty evil very evil without being possessed so yeah um but in his particular case um my own personal opinion is and i think if i remember right uh father Amor actually had a case where the demon said that he was the spirit that had possessed hitler Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that, Father. And from Momo, I have a friend who was involved in occult activities as long, a long time ago, he specifically ghost hunting. Now he is experiencing paranormal activities in his home. I constantly remind him to confess to a priest and to undergo deliverance prayers. My question is, by helping my friend learn about spiritual warfare, could I possibly attract retaliation from the devil? Uh, no, as long as you're staying in the state of grace, receiving the sacraments, and staying first for your protection mm. and maintaining your prayer life, your odds of being retaliated are very slim. It's only if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing that you're more likely to get retaliated against. And usually, if you're just telling them, hey, I think you should go see a priest, and even if you make a recommendation, I haven't seen, I, I've seen virtually, I haven't seen anybody really that's retaliated for doing that. Mm. Thank you for that, Father. And from Helga, is it true that your guardian angel has a name? He does, <laughs> but um, the church has said you're not permitted to name him because yeah. you want to name something you have to actually have authority over him. Um, what his name is, we will find out when we get to heaven. Their mm. name is the same thing as their essence or nature. And so we will know that when we see them. And from Lee and Samson, often referred uh, often referred to as uh, the modern St. Thomas Aquinas. I would like to ask Father Child about his perspective on visionaries such as Luz de Maria, Pedro Regis, and others. Thank you. Um, well, you know, a lot of the people that are visionaries currently, I tend to just tell people like this. That's um, it depends on what you're talking about modern day. If you're talking about those that have, that their apparitions have been approved, um, like in Venezuela, Britannia, which is a more recent mm -hmm. one, or Akita, Japan, or things of that sort. Uh, you know, obviously the church has approved them, so uh, I tend to think that they're authentic. Um, but otherwise, when it comes to the other ones, I've studied some of them. 
but I really don't weigh too much in on them because my attitude is that's really the place of the church, the local bishop, specifically unless Rome uh, derogates it to themselves. So I just tell people wait until the particular bishop says anything. I tell people I wouldn't give too much credence in any apparition until the church gives approval to it. <laughs> so um, I usually tell people just spend judgment and just wait um, until the church actually gives approval. And then when it does, take the time and read it and see what our Lord and our Lady want us to know. Mm, uh, what can you say about uh, Father uh, Chad about a weeping image of just like a weeping image of Our Lady, a Blessed Mother, just like what happened in Akita? Um, yeah, I mean, there are certain circumstances where it's actually authentic. Someone just sent me a notification, I don't know if it's true or not, that actually the stones in the Holy Sepulchre are actually, um, there is uh, water and oil coming out of them. I don't know if that's true. The uh, guys just haven't been able to verify it. There are, so there's three ways in which this, there's three parts of this. Sometimes it's just a natural phenomenon. So here in the United States, they, there was a statue that they thought was weeping, and they found out it was actually the roof leaking. Mm. You couldn't really tell until you got very close, etc. Um, so it can just be a natural phenomenon. Sometimes um, the demons can cause it, so you have to kind of be careful. This is one of the reasons why the church is, you know, does a thorough investigation into these situations mm. to make sure that they're actually mm. looking at what is the possible cause of this. It could be something that's diabolic because demons mm. can cause that. That's not very common, but they do. And then, of course, it can actually be authentic. And in that particular case, you see... Uh, statue of Our Lady weeping, it means she is expressing sorrow at some sinfulness of man or some disorder that we need to address. And usually when those um, the weeping occurs, uh, like in, in the case of Akita, well, we know that Our, our Lady Akita said, well, the chastise is coming, and so, you know, mm. um, and so there's, it's a, it's a warning. It's basically, I've always taken Akita to be the fulfillment of or one of the, the apparitions that's connected to it in the fulfillment of Fatima. And so because there's they're in tandem and they kind of work together. Um, so I think that's obviously the weeping statue is drawing attention to the fact that she's weeping over man's sinfulness and the, the coming chastisement. I think. Mm. And in there she she's very clear that the chastisement will be very severe. Mm. And uh, what are your thoughts on onanism, especially in the context of Catholic married couples? Okay, well, obviously the church is, yeah. Okay. Um, the church has um, condemned that. Um, mm. The technical Latin term historically in the tradition was coitus interruptus, which would actually stop the, the process, the, the conjugal act. And the church has always said uh, the technical Latin term is pollutio, that is climax, what we would say in English, uh. has to occur in, new, in normal unions. So um, so that particular, uh, the, the onanism in the context of marriage was always considered gravely sinful and it can actually, we've actually seen um, people have diabolic influence issues when not clean up until they started following the natural law of the right order. Oh. Because they did that, then their diabolic issues were clear. Uh, how many Catholics practice this? They are not talking about like NFP or Natural family planning, or yeah, I know, and NFE, but I, I've, I've known many Catholics that they did not know that onanism is a mortal sin. I mean, they are not aware of it. Yeah, most, yeah, actually, a lot of people don't know that it actually is. But the but the, the constant teaching of the church has always been that it's grave matter, and so that's mm. um, uh, that's one of the reasons why we try and educate people on it. It's, it's very important to share, uh, to know more about that, especially uh, you talk mm. about that. Yeah, it is. Or if, if, even if it's not the cause of the demons getting into the marriage, sometimes drive that kind of thing, and so mm. a lot of times they can't get the demons out of their marriage or out of their family life until they kind of stop doing those particular practices mm. and father have you seen the devil in real flesh <laughs> <laughs> well, it hasn't appeared independently of manifesting through somebody so in that sense no but i have seen um satan was for mbl's above oh. well, it's called morphing it's where the person changes shape and st yeah. thomas says they take the, the manifestation is to uh, show the characteristic, the personality characteristics uh. of the possessor. And so I have seen manifest. And so um, 
Uh, and so they do have distinctive characteristics that you actually see on that. So it is like looking at him if he was to appear to you. Mm. And Father, maybe this is, this will be the last question. Why you love being Catholic? I love being Catholic because um, the, I, if I had to boil it down to it, it's, um, it's kind of like G.K. Cheshire said, if the Catholic religion isn't true, we should make it up anyway because it's so noble and fantastic. Mm. But I, I just find that it, the truth of it is makes sense of our lives, and it's the only thing in the end that I have found in my own personal life that gives any sense of fulfillment, and joy, and happiness. It's going to be long term. And I think it's it's the it's the one thing that that is I got to study philosophy because my doctor's in philosophy and study all sorts of different religions and things like that. It's the old and also just studying other science and things like that. It's the only thing that I thought, you know, this is something that is noble enough and is um, is beautiful and good enough for me to be able to dedicate my entire life to it. So it really boils down to the fact that, and especially as an exorcist, you, as I mentioned kind of in the beginning, you get to know how true it is. And so mm. the teaching of the church, as, especially as an exorcist, is you see the beauty of it and how um, joyful it is just to be able to mm. contemplate the various doctrines of the church. So it ultimately just boils down to the fact that as something that's true it just naturally appeals and father chad is there anything you want to promote our viewers or there uh, do you have any upcoming projects um no other than i'm just uh just we continue to write um i'm hoping again i should probably contact the uh the editors of the philippines the, or the mm. hollings who are actually doing the um printing in the philippines and see if they would be willing to pr um, publish the book dominion because i think if we could get it over into the philippines it would help a lot to give people yes. clarity about how spiritual warfare works how the angels work how demons work and what they can do to kind of help themselves but other than that um my project that i have coming up is i'm driving um so i wrote a book on the introduction of science and mental health. I wrote mm -hmm. Diabolic Influence, which is actually a discussion of the intertwine between human psychology and diabolic psychology. Wow. And so the last book I'm going to write on psychology is on the psychology of masculinity and femininity. And mm -hmm. um, I started it years ago, put it on hiatus, and now I'm picking it back up. So my hope is to have that out in a couple of years. Yeah. That's a long project. So, But that's all I'm working on. And that in my normal podcast and things of that sort. What is the name of your podcast, Father Chad? Well, I think I do most, almost all of my um, conferences and homilies and everything are on Census Fidelium, the YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Census Fidelium. Mm -hmm. You can also, if you don't want to watch them on YouTube, there is a place online called Spiritus. Uh -huh. TV. They have all my conferences. They actually have conferences there that do not appear on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> and um, I do have my own channel that I put a few things on. Um, I'm just about to post. A, I have a series of conferences or a series of shorts that I did on communism. I have another one that's coming up. It'll be about two hours long on oh. showing how diabolic psychology is identical to, to communist psychology and oh. why people have to be aware of this. This is why you know wow. people have communists been involved in, in, in getting charged as it goes back. Uh. Well, this is part of the reason why. But um, so those are the. I just it's called this is. Uh, Traditionalities, but you can also go to my website. It's traditionalities. Um, as I mentioned, I do have a press called Centrad Press, S E N T R A D Press dot com. The difficulty is, though, is that for us to ship books overseas, mm -hmm. we do have some books available out of uh, Australia. So I don't know if you can get them cheaper through Australia, then obviously it's going to be cheaper than probably shipping, shipping them from here. But over the course of time, we're hoping to get stuff printed actually in the Philippines so that it's more affordable for the people there. It kind of avoids the shipping cost. And um, the, uh, it's kind of funny because um, I almost told the guys publishing this one in the Philippines, hey, why don't I buy these books from you and sell them over here because they do a better job at it. <laughs> and it's a more beautiful book and it's well done and um, and it's a lot cheaper. So, yes. I, uh, but anyway, so that's kind of our hope going forward. Mm. Well, we're looking forward to that, Father. And uh, any last word to our viewers who are watching right now? Um, no, just other than keep the faith 
it doesn't matter how bad things get uh god is always in charge and stay faithful to him and he'll always provide you everything you need um to be faithful to him so um would you like a blessing before we leave yeah yeah uh and a closing prayer father chad benedicto deo nipotentis patris et fili et spiritus which means superimposed to the planet stem there amen amen the first and our speech Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Father Chad Perger, for this uh, amazing interview and uh, to all your insight that you shared to us. And it's very helpful. And uh, thank you so much, Father Chad. And rest assured that we will continue to pray for you. We will pray please for sir. your ministry. And please continue to pray for us, Filipino. <laughs> I will. Yeah. And we are looking forward to see you in person here in the Philippines. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. It's just a matter of, at some point, it's just a matter of how the schedule is going to start slowing down here over the next year's year, so hopefully I'll be able to uh, yeah. get invited again and go over. And surely I will be there to see well, you, be great. Be great to, to hold your hand, to shake your hands. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much, Father, and uh, you are always in my prayer, and God bless you. I know it's already late there, and thank you for your generosity for all those oh, you're very that you share. All right. Thank you, Father. God bless. God bless. See you soon. <laughs>